know a huge variety so that you get the best sound if you want the timber to be to have the straight grain then you also want to have the timber absolutely cortisol the growth rings are completely perpendicular to the face of all the timber that's what you call cortisol my own preference is to build a flamenco negra with a cedar top. A bit of, as a joke, and I say, if the timber is boring, it's great. There is no character, yeah, but that's what we want. But what are you looking for? The bridge is also a very, very important part of the guitar. We mustn't forget that the bridge, at the end of the day, is another strat fixed onto the soundboard. The most common timbers that we use, guitar makers, to build uh, guitars, um, it, there's not a huge variety. So when, when we're talking about building Spanish guitars, and by that I mean classical and flamenco, uh, we have a sort of limited range of, of timbers that we use. Normally, we use spruce or cedar. Spruce, there's a variety of different types of spruce. The one that I personally uh, prefer is what's normally called uh, German spruce. But it's not really because it comes from Germany. Usually the, the, the type that is most commonly found is perhaps from the Swiss Alps. So I've got some here I can show you. So I'm gonna bring this one over there and a few more sets in here. And I also have a few sets of cedar. The cedar one that we have here is what you call Western Red Cedar from Canada. But let's, let's have a look at the spruce first. So for me, spruce is, um, is a beautiful timber to work with. And perhaps one of the most basic characteristics that you look in this timber is for so that you get the best sound out out of out of the, the, the out of the timber for the guitar that you're making is uh, a few very basic things which are very easy to describe and and very easy to recognize. The first thing is is the visual of of the wood. You want the timber to be to have the straight grain, beautifully um, beautifully straight. You don't want to have very twisted grain and things like that because that's not ideal for, for working but also for the stability of the timber. Then you also want to have the timber absolutely cortisol. So this is very easy to see here. You just look at the end grain and you can see how the, um, the growth rings are completely perpendicular to the face of, of the timber. That's what you call cortisol. So yes, the most important thing about um, the timber being cortisone is that it's the best cut of the tree to provide the most stability and, and the most structural integrity for the instrument. So what it means is that when the timber is expanding and contracting, like it will always happen, uh, like any piece of wood, it behaves a little, a little bit like a sponge and it will absorb uh, moisture from the air and when the humidity and the environment changes, it, it, will, it will release that humidity and the timber will dry a little bit. So all of that translates into the timber in a slight growth and a slight contraction. And if the timber is perfectly cortisol, which is the most optimal part of the, of the tree, when you cut the tree in different planks and so on, 
what that allows is for the timber to grow, um, to, so, so to move in a very stable manner, so that it interferes very little with the structural integrity of the instrument, which is what you want. But then what happens is that if you have, let's say, completely the opposite. You've got a flat zone uh, timber, which it means that instead of having the timber being quarter cell like that, the, these growth rings, they have a big angle or, or even nearly parallel. So what will happen is that the timber, when it, when it changes uh, because of the humidity, it will really warp and it will, it will get deformed quite severely. So that definitely is just not going to be any good for, for any kind of a musical instrument, never mind guitars. So we talked about the straight grain, long along the board, being cortisone. You want to know about the run out. The run out is really the direction of the cut along this edge. Here it's not so easy to see, but sometimes you're very lucky to see some specks on this edge, which it will reveal the kind of angle that you have. However, it doesn't always show. And here you have to do a little bit of an act of faith that you know that the, the, the suppliers and, and the places where the timbers are cut, they know what they're doing and they're gonna split the log. They're gonna cut it in wedges. They're gonna find the natural fibers so that then you don't have to be dealing with that too much. Nevertheless, it's something that you want to take into account and here I got a little bit of flaking, which is already indicating that this is uh, it's got the grain in the right direction. So basically, it's the the concept that the grain mustn't be in an angle like that. The grain needs to be as long as possible in this direction, not only in this direction. And then finally, you want the rings to be really as tight as possible. So here you can see, I don't know how many. I mean. You know, in some books you you read and they say so many lines per, per inch. So here, if an inch is about this much, here you've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You've got easily about 25 lines in one inch. So this is really nice and tight and that means that this soundboard, when it's worked and thickness, it can be re relatively thin because it's already strong. And then you just do a normal flexibility, flexibility test. You just flex it and see is this the kind of rigidity re that you're looking for for the timber. If it's too flexible, well, I wouldn't say that it's not good, but you definitely have to work it in a different way than if it was quite rigid like this one. And those really are the basics the um, characteristics that you're looking for in a soundboard. So now this, these are the basic characteristics for the spruce. Um, so we can have a look at cedar. So there are no major differences in the way that you select cedar in comparison with spruce. But as you work with them, you understand that they behave differently and they have different strengths. But when you want to select it, you're looking for the same things. You want absolutely cortisone timber and you look at the end grain to check that it's absolutely spot on. You, you don't even want to have even a little bit of an angle. And then the same, you want the grain very tight and very straight, very straight. One thing that I didn't mention, which I can come back to it now, is about the espejuelo, we call it in Spanish, medallity race. And in here, you can see it. I don't know if you can see it in the video so well. I don't know if I can put it in the right angle, but basically it's this kind of effect that you only get if the timber is cortisone. If the soundboard or any other timber is not cortisone, you're just not gonna have it. And that's a good way of determining whether the, the soundboard is cortisone once the guitar has been built. Because when the guitar has been put together, you just don't you don't see the iron grain, but you do see the metallic rays, and it's basically this cross grain reflection where the the light is reflected in such a way that it's like little mirrors. That's why in Spanish it's called espejuelo from the word espejo, mirror, and it's basically the metallic rays, and that's one of those characteristics that. <clears throat> both in spruce and cedar you're going to have it but only 
if it's perfectly quarter song. If you have only a little bit of an angle, it's gone. You don't have it. So that's another thing to, to look for. The other thing is that you got this date in here. So this timba, I got it from this company in, in Italy called Rivolta. I really, I really recommend them because they're brilliant. They have all sorts of timbers, but I think they specialize in Swiss Alp spruce. And it's got this date, so it's not that I don't trust them that it's from this date. But for me, the best guarantee to know that this timber is ready to be used is that I am going to keep it in my workshop for at least a couple of years before I use it. If I can have it for longer, even better, but I'm not going to rely on this date here. So this is, I'm not sure really, it might be the 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 date when the tree was cut or it might be the date you know I mean you could ask them I never do because to me I, uh, it's not so important but if you see this date you could ask the company okay what does that date relate to however the best guarantee to know that is right is you do your own drying uh, I can tell just by the feel that's obviously something you're not going to see in the video but you might hear it this sound already tells me that it's really not that wet, it's not that new. So, but that's just a little guideline. So you want to know and you want to have it in your workshop for some time before you start using, and that's very important because the timber needs to acclimatize to your environment and, and to the place where you're working. That's really for any timber. So we talked a little bit about spruce and cedar, which are the two timbers that we use in general. Maybe the other guitar makers that they might use other timbers as well for the soundboard, but most guitar makers you find that this is what they use for the soundboards. Well, for me, there's, there's two elements here. One is the traditional element. And I think in the world of instrument making, we tend to stick to what we know it works. And we tend to be a little bit hesitant when it comes to new timbers because they do take time to develop and why to reinvent the wheel when it's already working. So there's a big element on that. But that was the case with spruce. Spruce has been used for making instruments even before than the guitar, like for the violin or for the piano and, or, or the clavicorn before the piano. You know, It's been used in the industry of making instruments for a long time and it's proven its acoustic qualities and that's why you use it. You use these timbers because they produce a good tone, a good sound, that's what you need. Is it possible that other timbers will do it? Yeah. How willing are you to experiment and make instruments that might work or might not work? That's a different question. Then this is what happened with Sida. Sida was introduced by the Ramirez family at some point. I can't remember exactly the date, but you know most people know it, that this was introduced by the Ramirez, and it really works. And it was a great contribution to the world of guitar making, and it's successful. But I'm sure in the beginning, when they started using it, I'm sure there were some musicians thinking, hmm, is it, is it going to work? So now it's been a long time and it's been around and we know, yes, it does work. But I wonder if back then some people had a bit of hesitation. Mm -hmm. And I think this really, this, this, is, this is the logic behind it. Why only these two timbers? Well, I'm sure there are other timbers that could do the job. There are other type of spruce that do a really good job. You've got Engelmann, you've got Sitka. They're used on steel string guitars. They, they're perfectly beautiful. Can you use them on classical guitars? Yeah, many people have. It's just that for me, my preference is this type of spruce because I believe that it's, the quality is a bit more refined. But, you know, it's also don't make it out there. So that's just my preference. Now, in the backhand side, we have a little bit more of a range. So, here I'm going to make a distinction between the classical and the flamenco guitar. And I'm going, start, I'm going to start with the flamenco because perhaps that's a little bit more kind of straightforward and 
that's not a huge bad idea. Inside the world of flamenco, we have mainly two types of flamenco guitars. We have what we call the flamenco blanca, the white flamenco, and we have the flamenco negra, the black flamenco. So the flamenco blanca is the instrument that is being built with cypress, which is quite pale, that's why that, that kind of nickname, blanca. So I'm going to get a couple of pieces here. Uh, let me get this. I'm going to bring this there. And these ones, I'm going to put them on top of the rose. So I, I love Cypress. Cypress is just a beautiful timber to work with. It has a beautiful smell. It's just every time. It's just transports you somewhere else because it's really intense. I don't know what I've read that in the old days in Spain, Cypress was used to line the inside of furniture because also this timber, because of the smell and so and, and other qualities, had the ability to keep away the moth, which then the, the clothes could, could be protected from, from that insect. And when you smell it, you can say, yeah, it kind of makes sense. It's just a beautiful smell. And when you make a guitar with cypress, every time you get the guitar out of the case and you open the case, you get this beautiful fragrance coming out of you. That's already a good preambulo <laughs> to, um, to play and enjoy an instrument. But anyway, besides all of those things, I've got this cypress from a company from Malaga called Madema. Great company. Um, they, they're not sort of, yeah, they, they're reasonably new in the market and so on, but they're doing a really good job. They bring in really good quality timbers. They're really doing, they're doing very well. And so we probably will leave a link somewhere uh, for this company, just in, one, just in case you want to check them out. And this Cypress come from them. And, you know, like everything, because they are here in Malaga, like I am, then I'm able to go over there and then I just choose what I like. So I was able to go and pick up a pile of, of Cypress. Here, this is not so dissimilar from where you're selecting the soundboards. You want the grain to be as straight as possible. You want the quartering to be as good as possible as well and everything as tight as possible. However, when it comes to the backhand sides, then sometimes you have to accept a little bit of um, how can I put it? Not that kind of perfection that you're looking for in, in the soundboard. So sometimes you find that maybe the grain is a little bit wider here and not so much in other areas. Like for example, you see in this set, you got very nice grain. It's a little bit more open here, but for the back, for Cypress, it really is not a problem. It's when you get familiar with these timbers and you get to learn what you can accept and also what is available because you don't always find what you want. But yeah, when, when you look, you want the grain to be very straight and as close as possible. The same when it's cortison, you also see the metallic rays, which is great. And so this is the typical timber used for a flamenco guitar, for a flamenco blanca. I got some sides here. And the same, you want them to be nice and straight all along the side. And especially for the sides, you want it to be really quartesan as well. And you can see this is beautiful. All of this is from this company, Madema. I love it. It's really good. Um, so basically, this is the typical timber that you use for a very traditional flamenco guitar, flamenco blanca. But also, you, you can find what's called a flamenco negra. So a black flamenco usually is made with rosewood. In this case, we've got a beautiful set of Indian rosewood. But there's other rosewoods you can use. Of course, you can use Brazilian rosewood if you have it. Uh, I have a few sets here, but to be honest, I don't use it that much because it's just a headache and complicated with uh, legalities and stuff. But I would say Indian rosewood is the timber that most makers and most players tend to, to use and to have for the flamenco negras. And you get different qualities on the guitar, 
Mm, again, for the flamenco blanca, the normal tendency is to have also a spruce soundboard, even though you'll see many flamenco blancas with a cedar top. Now, for the flamenca negra, it's the same thing. You can have a flamenco negra with a spruce top or with a cedar top. My own preference is to build a flamenco negra with a cedar top because I believe that with that combination between Indian and cedar, you can get that kind of percussiveness that you want in the flamenco a little bit more easily than with the spruce. Sometimes when I build uh, flamenco negras for clients and they wanted the, the, the guitar to have a spruce, sometimes they said, yeah, but it's a little bit similar to classical and sometimes the sound is not very clear to be flamenco. However, to be honest, this is all very subjective, very personal. For me, the biggest difference between the two type of guitars is more the player than anything else because the techniques that the classical player uses and the flamenco player uses are so different, so that has a huge influence on the way the guitar is going to respond. But of course, the guitar itself needs to enhance and needs to be a tool that the player can use. So obviously, it's not the same. But anyway, it's, it's kind of a little bit more complicated than that, but that's just the basics of, of the concept. So basically, my preference and what I understand to be the best combination for a flamenco negra is a piece of rosewood for the back and sides and a cedar top for, uh, for the soundboard. So that's more or less in general um, how it goes for the flamenco guitar. Now for the classical, there are lots of similarities and the guitars are really very similar. Mm, you know, there's no huge differences. And sometimes if you are not very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about this, you just don't know well, why is that classical, why is flamenco? So that might be the subject of a different of a different video. The differences between a classical guitar and a flamenco guitar and you know there's a lot of information there. But on the whole, most of the construction and the plantillas, the shapes and so on, they're very similar. However, the subtleties of the difference between one and the other one can make a big difference. So in the classical guitar, the same, we use cedar and spruce for the tops, and we've already talked about them a little bit. But for the backhand side, we have perhaps a little bit more variety. The, again, the most standard timber to use for a classical guitar for the backhand side is the Indian rosewood. And what you look on Indian rosewood is a bit like everything else. You want the grain straight, as tight as possible, as quarter, as quarter zone as possible. And in here you can see that the grain is really, it's not too bad, this is really nice, but it's not always super, super, super straight like in the spruce top. But this for Indian rosewood is just very normal because this is the way this timber is. It's, they're completely different. The trees grow in different way. So you have to understand and to accept that you know the structure and and the and and the way the grain lines grow and so on is very different. Nevertheless you still want to get timber that is as as close as possible with the grain, as cortison as possible. And this case for example this is a beautiful timber. It's very resonant, it's quite rigid and when you tap it yeah, you, you don't hear perhaps this too much, but you can tell there's a bit of tonality into it. And yes, you you want to always get the best uh, timber you can get in terms of the, the, the external qualities. And then you need to keep it in your workshop for a number of years to make sure that it's well seasoned and you can, you can use it and it's going to be dry and stable. Then we also have, for example, another timber that is very common for the classical guitar is the maple. Maple, you can see, completely different. Very, very pale. And there's a few different types of maples that you can use. The one that I like the best is what you call flame maple or tiger maple or curly maple. There's, there's a few names you can, you can use for it. And the thing about maple is that 
what I found, I mean, I could be completely wrong, this is just my experience, is that when, when you go into timber suppliers to buy flame maple for guitars, they, it doesn't tend to be a huge amount of quartering in them, or not quartering, but flame, which to me is what makes this timber m more beautiful. And I realized that what's happening is that, I don't know at what stage, but the best cuts with the best uh, ripples, it goes to the violin industry or to the electric guitar industry. So for me, I thought, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is to buy a block for an electric guitar, which is got amazing grain, and then I just get it resong and I get my own sets. Ends up being more or less the same cost, but the result is that I get pieces like this one, for example. It looks really messy because it's kind of bare like here from the sole. But you can see that the ripples here are phenomenal. And this is even big enough to get a big um, thread knot into here. Obviously, for a class of that, there's going to be a bit of waste, but I'll use it for something. But yeah, basically, that's the idea that you want to get. Uh, maple that it's very um, ornate and you have lots of ripples in it. This one also is beautiful because the grain is very straight. Maple has got its own difficulties uh, in terms of the way that it needs to be worked because it's very easy to bite into the grain and so you need to use a lot of abrasive with it. But then the sound is beautiful. I think not enough people um, know how beautiful the sound is of a, of a maple guitar. Again, well, I find a little bit personal to describe sound, you know, because they are very subjective uh, concepts. But I always find that the, the sound of maple is perhaps a little, bit, a little bit softer, but with plenty of sweetness and, and really beautiful. So it might not have that punch that Indian rosewood or all the type of rosewoods usually have, but nevertheless, it's also beautiful. There's another timber that I really love for classical guitars, even though most people tend to think that it's not the it's not what you use. It's cypress. So we we mentioned earlier on how cypress tends to be uh, traditionally the the timber that you use for a flamenco guitar. But I think it would be amazing if more players uh, realize how beautiful the sound is of a classical guitar built with cypress. Again, without going into terms that are very subjective, but again, the sound is really beautiful uh, from the point of view that you get this sweetness and you get this, uh, again, not, not like a very bold projection of sound that like you could get with, with rosewoods and timbers that are more dense. But nevertheless, you get a sort of sweetness, but it's not like maple. It's a different, it's difficult to tell. But when you hear them together, you can recognize that there are different kind of coloration to the tone. And again, like I say, it's very difficult. You will need to be doing like a demonstration of guitars of, of built in, in a very similar way, but with different timbers to be able to, to see these subtleties. You get, you get a special kind of clarity, but you also get a different kind of clarity with, with um, maple. But I don't know, it's just, it's just different. Um, but beautiful as well. So I would encourage people to, to use Cypress for classical guitars as well. It works really well. So much so that I know many classical guitar players that they choose to play classical music on flamenco guitars. And um, yeah, they, they're just able to produce a kind of tone that is really suitable for some, for some kind of music and it's really special. But usually uh, the action on a flamenco guitar is usually a little bit lower. So if you want to play classical, you raise the action a little bit on the saddle and then you get a little bit more clearance and the action is a bit higher. However, having said that, I've also found classical players that they like playing on the flamenco action as well. For some pieces where if the sound is not as clear because you've got a tiny bit of bassin, it's not the end of the world, but it's just so comfortable. 
that to them is just a very worth uh, a worth compromise, you know. So the action is is, is again another world, another another subject for 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 another topic, but. Um, yeah, it's it's important to get the right action for the right instrument, and definitely the classical guitar needs to have a little bit more clearance so that you can play more with more clarity. Yes, the main the main difference that I find in terms of the sound with guitars built with um, with rosewoods and then maple and cypress is that the kind of projection that you get with timbers that are more dense is perhaps more noticeable. So Indian rosewood, it's going to produce that kind of projection with more ease, more, more naturally. Yeah, rosewood tend to, to, to have more projection, and perhaps it's a sense of more power into the sound. And yeah, some players talk about being more surrounded by the sound when they're playing. But I think that all comes from, from the density that the timber has, which is you know definitely much more dense and you tap it and you can hear it already. But that makes me think of another timber that I really like for classical guitars. Many many makers use it, perhaps not as often as with Indian Rosewood, which is Pau Ferro. Pau Ferro is originally from from South America, and it's even a little bit more dense than Indian rosewood, and therefore it kind of produces this quality of projection and boldness to the sound, perhaps even more. Sometimes it reminds me a bit of the kind of sound that Brazilian rosewood can produce, because Brazilian rosewood, again, has a different structure to Indian rosewood and often is, is a little bit more, um, how can I put it, it's, it's a little bit more rigid and it's got that kind of brilliance, perhaps a bit more than, than with Indian rosewood. Again, you know, it's, I'm a little bit uncomfortable when I talk about these things because it's just so personal and to me what, what is a little bit sweet and a little bit warm, it might be something completely different to you and so it's difficult to, to describe these terms without actually having a guitar in front of me saying, producing a sound, and this is what I mean. To me, that's how I like to compare guitars and do it. But for the sake of describing things, this, this is perhaps the best we can do. Pau Ferro is beautiful. It's, it's got very big variety on colors and grain. And again, like all timbers, we try to find sets where the grain is very straight, but then because of the size of the tree and what's available, it's not always so easy. So when you find a piece like this, which you got a section with very straight grain, to me this is the most stable part of the, of the timber, then you got the crown cut, which is where you see these, these um, half circles. It looks beautiful, but then I am aware that this is not the most stable part of the timber. So if I'm going to use this set, I'm going to have to position it in such a way that I lose as much as possible of the area that is not so stable, and I utilize as much as possible the area that is more straight grain. Sometimes I tell my students, um, my students sometimes they have me, oh, why this or why not that? And sometimes I have this, a bit of as a joke, and I say, if the timber is boring, it's great. Boring, meaning that it's straight, there's no interest, there's no character. Yeah, but that's what we want, because we want stability, we want the timber to, to be as perfect as possible. So when you find things like this, yeah, this looks beautiful, but... So you always have to learn, okay, is this too much of a problem for this kind of timber? Well, if it was in spruce, I wouldn't touch it. But for this kind of wood, well, I can work with it, because, for example, I could do a three-piece, so I can put one piece in the middle of a different set of power ferro or even from a different timber, make it a bit bigger, so it means that I can utilize the good part of the timber or the set without having to use the rest of it. So, you know, here you have to use your imagination and your experience to, to get the best out of the timber. Sometimes you get this section of sap wood, which is also very nice, and again, the sap is not always up for the job, 
but again you need to make the decision as to whether the subwood is structurally sound or not and if it is then you can use it on the on the bag and if it's not you just cut it off and and get rid of it so pau ferro that's a really good another option for a classical for a classical guitar So yes, in terms of what you're saying about tapping the timber, and you know when you go and select the timber to the to the shop, to me that's the best option because then you get what you want. Sometimes when you ask them to send you timber, sometimes you get what you expect, and sometimes you don't. Most of the time, I think my experience is that when you speak to suppliers, they tend to try to accommodate your, what you ask them. But again, this is very personal. So when you go into the timber, sometimes um, when you go into the shop, you can choose the timber. And some of the things that you do, apart from the, the visual and, and the feel and all these things that we talked about, sometimes you also tap the wood. My students ask me a lot about this. Sometimes they say, oh, but what are you looking for? And it's, again, this, this is a little bit personal. Um, you can see all timbers have a different different tone, a different pitch, if you, get, if you get a piece of Indian rosewood and you tap it, you have to find the place where to hold it, and this one is not going to give you a lot because it's quite thick and it's, but uh, some words tend to respond quite well, so sometimes people say to me, okay, what do I need to look for when I'm looking for timber in, in the shop, and this might be a little bit controversial, uh, but here I said, I don't really mind too much. All I'm looking for is for a, for a reasonable, good response of some kind of tone that you can see that there's a bit of a ring to it and, and that the instrument is responsive. I'm not the instrument, but the sound, the, the, the board. So here you can, hear, you can already tell that this is kind of likely and, and it's gonna produce some kind of sound. I know there are other people who give a lot of thought to this and they work a lot with this kind of uh, parameters in terms of the tap tone of the timber, but to, you know, relating to the thickness, relating to the size, because obviously that's going to be different. If I get another piece of cedar and it's a bit thicker or a bit bigger and so on, when you tap it, it's going to sound different. And also, depending on the amount of lines, the type of grain. So to me, I use it more as a, as a guide to know that it's kind of going to give me a response. Sometimes you, you tap it and you can tell. You get a note, but it's kind of a bit, it decays quickly, it doesn't give you much. So when you're looking for, for a soundboard especially, that, that's usually what I'm looking for. And some kind of response where there's a bit of a ring and a little bit of sustain into the sound. Anything, but anything. one note, I'm not really too concerned about it because the note is gonna be different depending on the size, on the thickness, on this and that. So I don't, I don't really follow that parameter. But that's just my personal opinion. When you're looking at other timbers, for example, you, you're working with Cypress and you tap it, you just know you're gonna get a completely different response and when you want to to kind of make a, a decision as to how dense it is I tend to tap it with the nail and you get that kind of sound but then if you go and get rosewood for example you can tell it's just completely different and it's indicating it's, it's got a much a, a, quite a bit more density to to the board and again if we get power ferro The same, if you tap it with the flesh, you get something, but it's a very short note because it, it's very rigid. But then when you tap it with your nail, again, you get an idea of the kind of density that this has. And you also see it because you, you uh, flex it a little bit and you can tell this is, this is tough. There's another thing that I really like using a lot for classical guitars. You could also use it for flamenco, but it's what you call in Spain coral, which is basically baduc. 
and you can see this is tim this timba is this really nice uh, orange uh, paduk is a completely different uh, species in its own right from from other timbers however to me it's response and in terms of texture and type of grain to me it, it's very similar to indian rosewood but it's not the same okay, don't get me wrong it's just i'm trying to kind of uh, put it in the right box so that you understand and you see what, what kind of timber it is. It's also fairly rigid, you get that kind of high density tone when you tap it. And the same, you're looking for cortisone. Here you can find straight grain very easily, like this one, you can tell there's, there's nothing untowards. And so it's a really good timber to use. And the sound, it's got that kind of boldness and strength like you get with the Indian rosewood but you also get this added bonus of a beautiful aesthetics to it when you do this with very dark bindings made of very dark rosewood or even ebony it's just you just got a beautiful contrast and then when you polish it wow it, it just looks fantastic so yeah this is this is another timber that is quite common perhaps not the most typical but very very often you'll see uh, classical guitars built with, uh, with paduk or coral, as we call it in, in Spain. Uh, I also got a few bridges over here. Let me just get them over here. The bridge is also a very, very important part of the guitar. And here, again, there's a few schools of thought. For me, the timber that I prefer to use the most is Indian rosewood, again, because I'm trying to stay away from CITES certificates and so on, uh, because you could use Brazilian rosewood and it would do a fantastic job as well. I would stay away from ebony, from anything that is really too rigid. Maple, again, is I'm not really sure that I would want to use maple, and again, there's, there's no need to try to reinvent the wheel when we know that the uh, Indian rosewood course really well. In the bridge you really want also stability so it's very important to find pieces that are well quartered and the grain very straight because then the bridge needs to be big enough to withstand the tension of the strings which is quite a lot however it needs to be light enough so that it's flexible because we mustn't forget that the bridge at the end of the day is another strut fixed onto the soundboard. So if it's just big, chunky and rigid, it's really gonna restrict the ability of the sound to be able to or, or the soundboard to be able to vibrate. So the bridge is something that I pay quite a bit of attention to. And yeah, when it's done, it's beautiful, it has a tremendous amount of work for such a small piece of wood and everything is very fiddly, very small but if you pay attention and you do it carefully and you know you do things in the right way you can really tell the difference between a classy bridge and one that is just being slapped on the guitar and it's a factory made bridge which is nothing wrong with it it's just a different thing so I don't get me wrong I'm not, I'm not saying that you cannot use a factory made bridge or anything like that it's just a different thing and if you're gonna build a top end instrument I think you need to build it yourself and and do it just right. So the bracing here I've got a couple of blocks of Swiss um, Swiss Alps spruce and Basically, what you're looking for the braces is timber that is really, really refined and really, really good quality. Here, you want the grain to be even tighter if you can find it than even for, for the soundboards. If you can find soundboards of, of this quality, then it's great. But unfortunately, I think you find this quality really in the violin industry more than in the, in the classical guitar industry. It's just the way it is. However, for strats, sometimes you find these pieces which are not big enough to make a violin, but 
we can get lots of really internal, good, really good quality internal components out of here. <clears throat> so here you go, the grain is super straight. You see the metallic rays everywhere because the grain is just right. Um, over here you can see it's very nicely quartered. And usually what I do with this, uh, you can buy this from most suppliers. These ones I think they come from Madinte. But Madema also has a very good supply of this this uh, type of um, type of spruce. And usually what I do is that I split it and I break it so that it breaks what it wants to break so that I get the timber to be as good in terms of drying out and then I start cutting it from blocks like this. And the idea is that the struts tend to be very small. In most of my guitars, the struts tend to be around about three and a half millimeters wide and the tallest ones tend to be maybe around about four millimeters maybe five but usually about four and the lowest ones tend to go as low as one millimeter and things like that so they're very small and very thin and you want them to be stable and you want to provide a good level of strength and because they're so small the timber needs to be really good because it means that if it's going to be three and a half millimeters small, which is let's say about this much, and the timber is really nice and tight, well here I can tell I've got about five lines. So it is going to provide good structural input into the into the sample. If the grain is very wide, and I make a small a strat of three three and a half millimeters. If I get only one line from the winter growth, that's just not going to be so strong. So with this, it's possible to get outstanding quality and it's worth to use it. And because it's available, why not? So for whether it's a classical guitar or a flamenco guitar, whether it's for the harmonic bars or for the uh, fan strats and so on, I always use this stuff. For the back, Normally, I uh, use see that for the back parts, but for the top, for the soundboard, everything that goes behind the soundboard, inside the guitar, it's made with this. Really, really, for me, it's really important. Again, uh, I know there are other makers that have different ideas, and I think that, you know, that's great. But that's how, that's how I do it, that's how it works for me.